So, yeah, this is lecture eight of Serious Games course. Well, we're presenting this paper for the ethics of uh, video games. May end up on the training of the next generation. Uh, this uh, paper is more like a discussion paper. It's not a pure paper review or pure research. So there's a um, discussion of ethics, both good and bad. Um, and it wants to focus on educational training games, but it also mentions uh, regular games a lot. All of those examples, um, and um, the paper discusses how um, many of these games can encourage players to perform uh, actions that uh, normally are considered unethical, and uh, what the real-world consequences uh, by doing this would be. Uh, it also goes into mentioning the. Uh, uh, Goistic sides of uh, games. And I'm both positive and uh, negative ways. So it begins by the good. And uh, I'm sure we're all very familiar with several of the good things uh, about playing games. We could improve critical thinking, they've been used for rehabilitation, for example, games. Um, uh, they use the Wii for rehabilitation of the strokes and they can use creativity, improve hand eye and coordination. So, several of these games have been used for healthcare, eye training, teaching history in schools or uh, in the military. For example, making agents think kind of high pressure making uh, decisions like that. Or, um, uh, America's Army that was used mainly to um, group people. They were also mentions uh, the use of Sim City for social questions and um, oh, City, I suppose. So there's no doubt that all these games are really useful, but uh, why? They um, described that these games have a lot of uh, Active participation, because it requires lots of focus and attention, and, uh, uh, and uh, tasks are repeated lots of times, which are key factors to learning. So when you mix this with uh, uh, intrinsic motivation from games, where they have, want to beat the game, um, then you get uh, a type of uh, engagement that really uh, that contributes to uh, learning and it motivates players to learn and search for information even outside of uh, the game. For example, they use the example of the geocaching. It's this treasure hunt where you use GPS to find things in the real world. And um, people want, they discuss it online and get clues and find things. And, uh, yeah. and uh, other ways that. Um, uh, games have been used to influence players with, for learning is in the military. There was one example that I really liked where the soldier that was um, explained that he, when he was uh, shooting a target, it was like being in a video game and he just reacted by instinct and just knew what to do and had no hesitation because he had practiced the same scenario so many times before and he was not a seasoned uh, soldier. So, is obviously effective. You could, of course, ask if this is uh, uh, ethically correct or not, because um, well, war is serious. It is. A, you could say that well, war is a game, but but it's not a fun one. It's very serious. So uh, it's a difficult thing to decide what is right or not. Uh, another example there. Kind of like I mentioned America's Army, um, which was a game set out to recruit people to join the army, and uh, several people called it a tool for propaganda. Uh, and um, since this game can be so effective, uh, you could ask if it's ethical to use them to mold ideas onto people. Um, 
had another part of the dark side of this. It's the long, long debate on who violent games and people violent. And uh, there are lots of examples there. They use this example where people blamed uh, Grand Theft Auto of uh, a guy who shot people after stealing a car because of him. He had played the game, and, uh, but um, and uh, the paper goes on to discuss the uh, distinction between the fictional and the real in games. And they use this um, model by a guy called Pavino that discusses the uh, difference between the external, um, what happens when the game is played, and the uh, internal, yes. And the external, what happens after the game is played, and he means that to say that there are no moral issues with games; that these two are completely separate. When you are done with uh, the internal gameplay, so if you get into the real world, and they are completely different. But he also goes on to say that if you enjoy violence and indulge in these games, then it could affect the external consequences. And he also doesn't mention how the um, positive uh, outcomes, that then you get the external uh, consequences. So it seems like he made this model just to cater to his own uh, um, that he wanted to prove that there was no link. Um, so, uh, because uh, well, with uh, several of these uh, training games, there's obviously some sort of uh, effect afterwards. For example, people are playing the increased arousal and, or even aggressive thoughts after playing violent video games. But, um, of, and of course, the, the training games that, for example, the games for depression uh, that you have people, then they are playing this game, but it does have an effect outside of the game. But uh, for now, at least this paper says that only meta studies uh, exist, so we don't really know. So there's no real solid evidence that link uh, games and violence. Uh, it's uh, still a very difficult thing. Mm. But apart from the uh, violent games, there are also some ethical issues of uh, addiction, which uh, is the most used for the, the MMO games, um, for getting addicted. And um, the paper mentions technical capabilities. It only briefly mentions some you know, young boys or girls, so I don't know what they Meant, but, and also um, gender and racial stereotypes. They point out to several games where various groups of people are stereotyped. So, and then there are also these uh, ethics uh, games. Well, basically games that were ethical choices or the learning outcome is. Uh, based in ethics. For example, uh, there was this game that did teach Buddhist values, um, or games that uh, give you ethical choices. But sometimes, uh, you know, if it could be a bit too black and white, or ethical indoctrination. Um, and uh, you've also got several of these games uh, it mentions the uh, fable that tells you the morality of your choices. Or, uh, I don't know, the game, it'll, the recent game, The Walking Dead, they can be considered violent games, but you still have lots of uh, vi um, ethical issues that you have when you have to make choices. Mm. But, um, hmm. And the next part of the uh, paper, they want to go on to uh, discuss uh, self-focused gaming, mm. which is basically all about you and uh, 
your amount of wins or your stats or your gear or how much you did or etc. They uh, got criticised uh, how many games are um, basically teaching the gamer to make decisions only based on their own benefit, around what makes me better, what gives me more DPS or makes me stronger or etc. Uh, for example, in some games where the only reason to save someone would be to increase your own chance of winning. But uh, the example they make, I get the feeling that it's more that the players will play the mechanic of the game just to uh, uh, to win, not that they're actually thinking of uh, saving this uh, wounded teammate, but uh, more of the other yeah, points. But it's still self-focused in a way. Uh, and, uh, this paper likes to mention Grand Theft Auto a lot. Uh, it, uh, it also mentions how in, that in this game you, uh, you get success by based on all, all, all your personal games and not how good you've acted. Uh, and uh, the paper argues that Perhaps uh, all these selfish decisions it could teach players that there are no consequences to um, making all these decisions uh, that are just selfish. Um, but uh, I think it portrays it as a little bit black and white because in some games there really are no consequences, uh, you know, at least in the game. So you can do everything you want and just get away with it. But for example, uh, uh, if you blow up someone's house in Minecraft, you will get consequences, right? Mm -hmm. So there is, there's so much uh, difference. And, and in some games, you can make a lot of choices and you will get penalized for uh, It might be a bit one-sided. Um, it also mentions uh, social games. and. Uh, Mostly uh, animals, but they say that people just prefer to play as this uh, solo character, where they can just do everything themselves. And uh, they say that even in the uh, end game, the people are just self-centered apparently, because it's all about what they can do and what, what the, where they can go and win, so they can get this shiny. The equipment that they can put on, and people can look at them and think that they're cool. But uh, I think those uh, those things act as you know carrots for the players. But there's so much more to it, and it's not all uh, that selfish all the time. You know, I've seen the opposite several times. People that people just help each other out all the time. So. But it's still interesting, uh, the um, um, the uh, notion that there is a lot of uh, selfishness in a lot of uh, games these days. But there's so much uh, about just you and how you make decisions that only make you better, instead of everyone around you. So, um, but maybe it's not surprising because uh, these days uh, everything is very self-centered. If you look at social media and all that, so maybe it's just a sign of the times. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I feel it. Um, in the last part, they made some suggestions to uh, game designers and. The essence of it was to think about what you put into your game and why, which uh, I think is pretty sensible sometimes. It could be good to uh, think about what kind of choice a game has and what um, uh, consequences that has within the game. Uh, they say that sometimes the game designers should hint players in the right direction. Uh, but if they want us to point the player into the right moral choice. Um, for example, they uh, um, suggest that players could, rather than being uh, uh, 
got measured by points or just the personal success. They could be based, um, the success could be based on how good they are. But it doesn't work like that in all games. So it's, uh, but overall, it's. Uh, I think it's good to uh, be able to look at what you create, particularly, and ask why did I put in these choices? Why or these consequences I make? Why are why are they there? Is it for a purpose or is it just oh for fun or because um, yeah it. Uh, I think it can probably sometimes be hard to look critically at the things you love, but uh, <laughs> but it's um, well that's what I took um, away from this uh, paper that it's uh, it can be good to be a bit critical and uh, really give some thought into what you put into your games. Mm -hmm. No, but the article it doesn't cover banning of games so. Uh, Anything like that. So I thought it was, uh, it tried to be neutral and present several uh, arguments. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have repeated about the ones you <laughs> suggested, so I guess we also found it interesting and relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to bring up something that I'd like to be uh, contextualized. <laughs> um, there is uh, there's been some work um, done at Carnegie Mellon. Um, <laughs> um, uh, very short, it's been looking at uh, engineering discipline for computer science, uh, saying that there is a discipline for uh, engineering and whether software engineering is a true engineering discipline. Now, uh, that's the only point here. What is interesting is to look at the introduction. Uh, she has a quote here that she had in an earlier paper uh, where they with defining what is engineering, what are the characteristics of engineering. And what she's saying here is that engineering, they define it as the branch of computer science that creates practical. So uh, software engineers should solve practical problems. There should be cost-effective solutions, uh, preferably by applying scientific <coughs> knowledge. That's how you make it into a scientific field. Developing software systems in the service of mankind. So that, that's where the ethics comes in. So what the Carnegie Mellon people uh, think about engineering is that when you engineer something, it should be practical, cost-effective, uh, and solving problems by using scientific knowledge. And we should have this ethical aspect that it should serve the best of, of humanity or, or mankind. So I think that is kind of the, the setting here. Now, there is a big discussion uh, whether games cause violence or or cause addiction. Uh, and I think that is a little bit beyond the point, as you were saying. It's mm -hmm. more about the choices we make and, mm -hmm. and whether we make it deliberately into something that is in the service of mankind or not. Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, it can always be argued, uh, for instance, in violence, you, you mentioned a couple of cases. There was also the case of the uh, Norwegian terrorist saying that he deliberately used games to desensitize, desensitize himself towards the action. And I think that if you want to, if you deliberately want to desensitize yourself towards something, obviously a game is one way. But mm. you could also just be there meditating or just, I mean, there are many mm. mental tools you could use. So if the purpose is to achieve this, obviously you can achieve it. The question is whether the casual user is in any danger, and that is a more uh, an open question. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the whole paper here, I think, is, is it raises the issue of even if it does not necessarily harm the casual user, is it in the service of mankind? Is it something that we sh would, if we have a choice, is that the the uh, natural 
or, or a good choice. I think it's, a, it's about awareness. It's about uh, thinking about the, uh, um, um, the uh, implications and usefulness versus um, the, uh, some of the uh, ethical issues, even though there isn't, as I'm saying, there isn't a proven link from playing games and becoming violent or, or uh, becoming addicted to game because the game itself. I mean, there, there are addictions to many different things, and, and whether they, or if the game wasn't there, maybe they got addicted to something else. And, mm -hmm. uh, and whether it's good or bad, I mean, my, my daughter, she's reading thousands of pages of books every, every week. It, that's an addiction. Is it good or is it bad? I mean, that's a little bit of a different dis discussion, but I think the important thing here is that awareness, that if we're rushing into something, we stop and say, is this the best of mankind? Could it be better? And especially with serious games. But if, as you say, war is serious business, and if the purpose of the training is to desensitize the, uh, the soldiers to certain events, and, and they need to be desensitized to survive, it's, oh, a different, it's a different, it it's a different type of discussion mm -hmm. than what you do for a more casual user. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it would be necessary, but not always. Well, Definitely. I'm being uh, aware and knowing what the uh, what are the effects you would like to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that is a, a question whether the casual users is desensitized the same way as the training soldier, uh, because the the way you approach the tool changes the way you kind of the tool shapes you. So I don't think if um, a casual player played the games and then was put in the circumstances that the, the reactions would be exactly the same as the soldier who was doing the training. And train himself to, to, to do that. Uh, that that is, a, yeah. I don't know that that raises the, the question of yeah how you can transfer that those, those skills. And probably with a casual user or player, probably there is also a personality side of this. Some person exactly. is very active and mm -hmm. impact mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that stuff is about addictive personalities. People are really prone to getting addicted to things, for example. And uh, but, uh, I think that keeping this this quote uh, whenever we work, I think it's good. I mean, we are looking for practical solutions. They should be cost effective. And we talked about that, and that's uh, the other paper also raises this issue. Uh, the calibration game paper is okay. Now we can see it has a better impact, but this is cost effective. Mm. There are some resources. It's it, you could say one is the development cost, another would be the cost of the player in terms of arousal or in terms of time spent or, or whatever. So, engineering <laughs> objective should be to think about those costs first and reduce the costs so that we have a cost effective solution. And, uh, and uh, not disregarding science, and think about uh, the uh, service of mankind. So I think that this is quite a good uh, golden levers uh, as, as a kind of an objective or mantra for what they're doing. I think that's a good yeah. definition. So, so the, the, there was the third paper which I reviewed as well, the gamification one, and they discussed different effects, the gamification of normal systems have on people. And they say it's actually very difficult to, to do the evaluations because you have to take the player into account and the context. And you normally don't have that. And you don't normally control that. And you can't control it. And you cannot control it. So at the end of the day, those two confounding variables are the strongest to influence the outcome. So it might be the case here as well. So the context, you're in the army, you are in the training, and your particular personality Results in that particular. I want to, uh, but go on to do uh, to take on some uh, 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 evil action. If you have the term to do that, then of course games may have a good effect on that. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I remember a while ago I was reading about lots of the <laughs> serial killers and all that, and there were so many that uh, 
uh, actually mentioned to having deliberately read certain things mm. or listened to certain things or seen you know, using these you know, media as tools to put themselves in this mindset to do what they wanted to do. The music, films, mm -hmm. reading, so. novels, games, they're all in the same kind of bag. Uh, you can't use them always the same way. Or even Different meditation people. techniques. Yeah. yeah. Visualization. Very strong. And uh, so it's... Uh, yeah. Well, that's, uh... But yeah, I, I think you, you pinpointed that from the engineering point of view, that's exactly where we have control and where we can influence things and we have a choice. We have a choice, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, it's not possible. So what 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 do you think about the the issue of uh, creating apps or creating games or creating things which then are uh, used for wrongdoing or for bad things. There's always theories. It really depends on what you make. Yeah. But uh, in the context of serious things, yeah, there's... So is the, is the risk of people misusing Grand Theft Auto or Halo or training themselves to do, you know, inhuman things? If they really want to, if they really want because to, because you have so much choice within the game, you could uh, you could play it almost with no violence, so you could walk around and have massacres every day. So, but is is that risk justifying the entertaining value of the rest of the players just playing the game for for fun? Mm -hmm. How big that risk is. So it does happen occasionally, as we have case with the Norwegian uh, situation, for example. But should those games be banned because of that risk, or is that risk negligible? So. Or is it possible to even prevent it? Because so those people will probably find something, no matter what, if they really want to motivate themselves. But uh, the only argument I could think of would be how we see or how available things are. But I really want to say no. <laughs> I, I think that if we if we phrase the question a little bit differently and put it in the context of serious gaming. Mm. But we are here. We are soft engineering. Uh, we're soft engineers working in the serious games business, and then the discussion might be a little different than in the uh, more entertaining world. In that, uh, that's right. We have a purpose, and, and, and one interesting discussion is uh, relevant discussion. I think is the arousal level, uh, because uh, I was uh, I was once impressed by. Uh, Climber, she was uh, thrown off the back of a horse mm -hmm. and got uh, cracked uh, her back, uh, cracked it. So she had a hard time walking. Her right leg didn't work, so she had a hard time walking. Walking, and uh, and uh, during rehabilitation, she started. Uh, she was doing the climb. Just mm -hmm. climbing, you, you, you are encouraged to use your legs, and, and it's about yeah. Dynamics of the moves and balance, and so it was uh, something that they quite amused. And she had a, a, a quite an um, amazing progress. And the uh, physical therapists believe that part of that progress was due to the fact that when she climbed, she was scared, and that the fact that she was scared made her brain overstimulate the neural system, which means that more impulses went through the new channels to stimulate her muscles. So the fact that she was scared was good in terms of retraining the body to get the neural signals back into the leg mm -hmm. and, and the other way as well. So the fact that in certain cases the arousal level has a purpose. So, so training them 
being afraid of being shot by someone else is obviously a, a strong motivator for, for so, so if what you're trying to do is to, to regain some um, some neural paths or, or train up neural systems that some cases you might want to actually arouse or, or push the, uh, the player but in that case it's a deliberate choice it's something you do for a purpose it has uh, a, a, a serious purpose it's not just because it's interesting to see how the players deal with that situation being stressed or being put at the, at the, at the edge. And then if it was used, uh, well, for evil purposes, it could be used to uh, worsen someone with psychological problems, for sure. example. Yes. For some people, for example, yeah, climbing would be horrifying. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> we know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, when I think of ethics in video games, sometimes I think that the debate is always running the violence, but there is a lot more stuff that going on as well. Um, and you, you didn't mention, but there there's the whole stereotypes and genders yes. and mm -hmm. nationalities. So, so I mean, that is not very contributing yes. either. And for so. example, within the well, serious games, uh, I've read some stuff about it. Just for example, the um, American Army example. Uh, if um, yeah, you think these games to well, in a way indoctrinate people with how to think or uh, we are like this and the enemy is like this and, uh, when you get it through a game it's quite powerful so uh, and then that situation is it's, uh, you could get a lot of uh, difficult settings. Uh, but, well, I, I think I actually think that the paper was quite good in, in discussing a few of these issues as well. We didn't yeah. just look at the violence mm -hmm. part or addiction part. Yeah. Look at the stereotypes yeah, because I think it, well, for the general public, some of those things they can tend to go unnoticed, maybe. If a, if a game um, portrays uh, some stereotypes, maybe the new or something, and uh, it uh, could help shape how people view a specific group of people, and uh, for most people, that's probably a bigger thing than if they are turning violent or not. So, uh, think of violence debate as uh, going out of proportions, perhaps. Yeah, it's kind of an easy topic to discuss, and yeah, there is. Mm -hmm. It's easier to have black and white discussion there, exactly. so that, that attracts the, the yeah. newspapers, mm -hmm. such yeah, But the subtle things like the, in the, the social uh, things that uh, these games create, those are a bit more interesting, but they get under the radar a bit. So. Yeah, I don't think there is any yeah, black and white answer or mm -hmm. black and white yeah, discussion possible here. Uh, the, the, the way people are manipulated and indoctrinated and so on, I mean, you can't prevent it. it, it it's mm -hmm. going to happen one way or the other. Like and It happens many ways. It, exactly. Yeah. It's not it just aspects games. of yeah. society. <laughs> so in a sense, it's good that it happens because then people can sort of desensitize themselves to this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have advertisements, you have posters, you have all sorts of ways of manipulating opinion and and so on, and I don't think blaming the tool is is reasonable here. I think those are just tools. If they were built with the wrong purpose, if they were built with the harmful purpose, then of course that was unethical and that was breaking those those rules which uh, we just read. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, those are I probably don't know. important things to keep in mind for well, if you want to make a game. So. Making something without even thinking about uh, what you're making. Mm. So. And for most, for most people who play games, playing a game is different to real world. Yeah. They clearly know the the, the differences, right? Mm -hmm. So it's only in pathological cases where th those boundaries are being blurred. Uh, and focusing on those is a little bit misleading because for most people it's it's clearly different to be shooting in a game and to be shooting in real life. Yeah. Um, I think that maybe some people that criticize games a lot, they 
could fail to see how people uh, like they just see the visuals of it mm -hmm. and not what people actually get out of it. When people want to well go somewhere and shoot someone in the game, maybe it's mostly because it, this uh, well thing that looks like a person in the game it represents uh, points or items mm. or and um, and a health bar that you have to get down um, and uh, all these things are probably what matters to you when you actually play it. But for someone who just wants to look at it critically, they just see the action of you click this button, you kill someone. Mm. So. But I think that the uh, so so what that also I think what, what the calendar worker referred to. I think what it was trying probably trying to say is that for most users, it's a clear distinction between the real world and this imaginary world. Now, as you were saying. For a few cases, it might not be that clear cut. Yeah. And for someone who's deliberately want to distance themselves, it doesn't apply. They, but for, yeah, but exactly. for the majority, majority of human beings are able to have um, an imaginary <laughs> and a real world understanding. And, yes. And how much then these people are at risk, that's hard to test. And, and, uh, that, but it's, uh, it's obviously something different from a few cases of the work It is difficult. Yes, that's, I think that's also why it's not very much <laughs> empirical. <laughs> it's the paper. It has to be yeah. a little bit more of a discussion type of paper. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, one thing which I do agree is that some of the choices that you make are kind of important. So if you decide a certain game mechanic uses a particular metaphor, that's your choice. You can use the same mechanic using a different metaphor, right? So I can be shooting an abstract punk type object mm -hmm. and have the same game as if I were shooting sort of pictures of people or, or something, right? Yeah. Uh, so from the game point of view, that wouldn't change the mechanic anyhow. It just changes the interpretation. And uh, those choices are sort of interesting. Like, yeah. I often play games, and I don't follow the story of the game. I just treat the, the actions as, as just mechanic. It's completely abstract to me, even though there is a story behind it. And even if the story is kind of awkward, if I think about it, it's like killing people or something, uh, it's, you know. But I don't think this way. I just treat it. Yeah, I, I have those actions. I have to make choices, and I play the game. And I think the designers who did those games, they made those choices, and I not necessarily have to follow what they thought. And they could have done different choices as well, right? They could have made a different story out of the same game, and it wouldn't change anything to me. Uh, so th th those are kind of interesting because I I think. Many people play the same way as I do, that they don't, they treat the game as an abstract kind of game system where you have certain actions, certain feedbacks, and that's it. Uh, there is nothing connected to real world in a sense. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the visuals that are put on top. Uh, yeah. Could just be it could be different, exactly. Yeah. And it wouldn't change the game for me. But, yeah. On the other hand, if you think about it, like Grand Theft Auto, if they use a different story and different things, it would be a different game. It wouldn't be Grand Theft Auto, right? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. But you could probably use some of the same things and have uh, a semi similar experience. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well. Short break before the second. Yes.